Hello everyone, welcome back for more human physiology. So this video is going to be a big one. So make sure that you buckle up because we are going to start talking about all the different hormones that we are going to try and keep track of in this chapter. We're gonna talk about some negative feedback and our, in particular, our focus is go going to be on the hypothalamus and the pituitary and how they kind of act as the master regulator of the whole endocrine system. So let's go ahead and not delay any further. Let's get after it. So negative feedback is going to still work in large part in the same way that we talked about in chapter one. So this is all about homeostatic imbalances, right? So hormones are going to be just a part of homeostasis reflexes, right? So when some parameter gets either too low or too high, we are going to be secreting hormones in various levels to make sure that we keep those things in check. So hormones, therefore, are going to be subject to negative feedback as well. We don't want to make too much of them, but we don't want to have too little of them. In a way, we kind of want the levels of hormone in the blood to be kind of within a normal range too. So if you recall, going back to our discussion in the communication unit on the simple endocrine reflex, we said that typically an endocrine gland, if it is acting all by itself, is going to act as both the sensor and the control center, right? So the hormone it secretes will be the output or efferent signal, and then whatever response results from that hormone binding to whatever receptor it's going to bind to on the effector, that should produce a response that's going to counter whatever the initial stimulus was. So nothing has really changed in that regard. So negative feedback, what it's going to do is once we restore homeostasis, once we get rid of that homeostatic imbalance, the gland should stop producing hormone until that parameter gets out of balance again. Then it's going to be time to have that hormone come back. But this is the case for a simple endocrine reflex, meaning a reflex that only involves one hormone and one gland. So the pancreas and insulin, or the pancreas and glucagon, are perfect examples of this. The unfortunate bit of news for us is that many of our endocrine responses are going to be much more complex than that. So more complex than what we talked about in the communication unit. So as it turns out, a lot of our endocrine glands like the thyroid, like the adrenals, and like the uh, testes and ovaries, they themselves and the hormones that they produce are going to be regulated by hormones that come from other places in the body, namely the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So what you're looking at in this figure here is how we regulate one hormone called cortisol. So cortisol is an important hormone in our stress responses, and we'll talk plenty about it later, so don't you worry about that. So cortisol is produced in the adrenal glands, but the adrenal glands don't have the ability to decide when it's time to secrete cortisol and when it's time to not to. So they can't really act as the sensor and the control center in that case. The sensor in this regard is going to be in the hypothalamus, which is a region of the diencephalon in the brain. So the hypothalamus is going to sense some stress-related need for cortisol. The hypothalamus is going to sense that imbalance, create a hormone of its own, which is called a releasing hormone. In this case, it's called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. That hormone is going to be released into the blood. It's going to go from the hypothalamus down here to the pituitary, specifically the anterior lobe of the pituitary. The anterior pituitary is going to secrete a hormone of its own called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. That hormone is going to get into the blood, and then that hormone will bind to the adrenal gland cells, and then we can finally get our cortisol production. So what you're seeing here is quite a complex system in which you would think there's only going to be one hormone involved. So you hear cortisol, you think, okay, cortisol is the only thing that we have to worry about. And the adrenal gland is the only gland that we have to worry about. Well, that's not the case. So we have, just in this reflex action, three glands and three hormones. And each one of those hormones is going to be subject to negative feedback. 
So you can imagine that the negative feedback is going to be a little bit more complex, a little bit more involved, more so than just waiting for whatever the stimulus is to go away. So negative feedback here for each of these three hormones in this particular reflex action, negative feedback is going to ensure that only exactly the correct amount of hormone gets released into the blood. As you'll be able to appreciate later on, we do not want to make the mistake of having too little or too much hormone. So we'll talk about one specific consequence of that, hyper and hypothyroidism, when we have too much or too little thyroid hormone. So as I was saying before, hormones, just like anything else, we prob in most cases, not always, but in most cases, we like to keep those within a normal range. So as we saw in the prior example with cortisol, and as we are going to see in other examples, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, two parts of the brain, are going to work together to kind of form this master control center of the endocrine system. They, for the most part, are the ones making the decisions on which hormones need to be secreted and at which times. Now, there are endocrine glands and hormones that are not under the control of the hypothalamus and pituitary, but a good number of them are. So this is definitely a good place to start. So as I mentioned, both of these glands are located within the diencephalon of the brain. In this blow up here, you can see the hypothalamus shaded in blue, and then you can see the two different lobes of the pituitary, an anterior and a posterior pituitary lobe, highlighted in green and purple respectively. And the hypothalamus is connected structurally and functionally to the pituitary through this stalk of tissue called the infundibulum. So, like we said, the pituitary consists of two different lobes. We have an anterior pituitary and we have a posterior pituitary. Now, you might be surprised to hear this or you maybe not, won't be surprised to hear this, but the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary pretty much have nothing to do with one another. They are about as different as they could possibly be. The anterior pituitary is derived embryologically from a completely different part of uh, developing tissue than the posterior pituitary. It's actually kind of a marvel that they ended up in roughly the same place. So what we're interested in here is how can the hypothalamus, and for a little bit of extra context here, the hypothalamus is going to act as kind of a multifaceted sensor in the body. It can sense things like changes in temperature, changes in osmolarity of bodily fluids, changes in metabolic rate. So the hypothalamus kind of has its fingers in a number of different places. It can sense a lot of things that are going wrong in the body. So the hypothalamus is the perfect part of the endocrine system to kind of coordinate many different responses. What we're going to be interested in here is how is the hypothalamus able to communicate with both the anterior and the posterior lobes? Now for the anterior pituitary, this answer is quite clear. You can actually see a network of blood vessels that connects the cells of the hypothalamus to the cells of the anterior pituitary. So what is clear here is that if the hypothalamus needs to send a message to the anterior pituitary, all the hypothalamus has to do is secrete a hormone into this portal system of capillaries here, and that hormone is guaranteed to make it down here to the cells of the anterior pituitary. Now, such a portal system does not connect the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. What you can see here is that the axons of these neurons that you see here in green and purple actually go all the way down through the infundibulum and connect to a blood vessel that is in the posterior pituitary. So if the hypothalamus needs to communicate with the posterior pituitary, we have to deal with electrical signaling in that case. And as I mentioned before, the anterior and posterior pituitaries have practically nothing to do with one another in terms of structure and function. They are about as different as they could possibly be. So this is a table that lists all of the different uh, anterior and posterior pituitary hormones. So this is where things is go are going to get a little bit nuts here. So... Uh, on Blackboard, I posted a blank hormone chart. So that's going to list out all of the hormones that we could possibly talk about in this chapter. So 
That chart is blank right now. So what you're going to want to do is fill out that chart as we go along here. So if you need to take a break from this video to print it out and kind of get ready for it, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to memorize all the different hormones. You're going to get a little bit overwhelmed and maybe a little bit confused if you try to do that. But what you can do is you can fill out that chart as we go along and then uh, when you need that information, instead of having to remember all these different hormones, you can have a filled out chart at your fingertips and you can work that way. So these are just the hormones that are produced by the anterior and posterior pituitary. So this isn't even all the hormones we're going to need to know about in this chapter. You'll notice here that one, two, three, four, five, six hormones are secreted and synthesized by the anterior pituitary and uh, two of them are secreted and synthesized by the posterior pituitary. So that's actually going to be important here in just a minute. So let's go ahead and start talking about each of these hormones one by one. But first, let's talk about the differences between the posterior and the anterior pituitary. So the first thing we want to go back to here is, do you remember our two criteria that have to be true if we're going to be, consider something to be an endocrine gland? Uh, so two criteria that have to be met. If we're going to call something an endocrine gland, that gland has to secrete at least one hormone. And that hormone has to be made by that gland. So you'll notice in the title of this slide, it says the posterior pituitary is not really an endocrine gland. It's not what we would call a bona fide endocrine gland. So here is the problem. The posterior pituitary does secrete two different hormones. Oxytocin, which we've been introduced to before in the childbirth example that we looked at in chapter one and in the communication chapter, an antidiuretic hormone, which is also called arginine vasopressin. So the posterior pituitary secretes these hormones, but it actually does not make these hormones. These hormones are actually synthesized in the hypothalamus and then once they are made, so they are made up here in the cells of the hypothalamus, and then once they are made, they are transported down through the axons of these neurons and then stored up down here in the posterior pituitary. So when the hypothalamus senses a need for either of these hormones, so in one case with oxytocin, when we get that pressure on the cervix and we get that message coming up to the brain, the hypothalamus gets that message and then sends an electrical signal down through these axons, and that's going to trigger the release of oxytocin into this blood supply here. And then that blood supply should carry that hormone, that oxytocin, to the uterus. And the same would be true with antidiuretic hormone, just with a completely different sensory mechanism and everything else. So we have two different regions of neuron uh, cell bodies. So cell bodies of neurons grouped together in regions called nuclei. So we have a supraoptic nucleus, which is going to secrete oxytocin, and a paraventricular nucleus, which is going to secrete antidiuretic hormone. And like we were saying, uh, when uh, these cell bodies uh, make these hormones and store them up down here in the posterior pituitary, all it really takes is an electrical signal coming down these axons to trigger those hormones release directly into the bloodstream. Okay, so we've talked pretty much ad nauseum about oxytocin up until this point. So we talked about this plenty in chapter one. We mapped this out as part of a neuroendocrine reflex in the communication unit. So we don't, we shouldn't really need to say a whole lot about this, but if you still are looking for some extra practice on this, you definitely want to go back and clear up uh, the hormone oxytocin now that we kind of know what to look for and what questions to ask, you might want to ask yourself what class of hormone does it belong to, which cells are likely going to have oxytocin receptors, so you're going to want to look out for what the effector is in this childbirth scenario, and then knowing what you know about oxytocin and what class of hormone it belongs to, where is its receptor going to be located on or in the effector cells, so I will leave that to you.
So now let's talk about antidiuretic hormone. We haven't really said anything at all about it. So antidiuretic hormone is going to be one of the ways that homeostatically we can respond to a deviation from the set point of blood osmolarity. You remember what the osmolarity of the blood is supposed to be? 300 milliosmolar, right? So when that osmolarity gets too high, meaning that essentially we lose water content from the blood plasma, usually when we're dehydrated, guess what? The hypothalamus is going to sense that. So the hypothalamus contains a type of sensory neuron called osmoreceptors. So these are going to be uh, sensory neurons that detect changes in osmolarity in the blood. So the hypothalamus, when it senses dehydration, it senses a loss of water content from the blood, it's going to send a signal to the posterior pituitary to release its stored up antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic hormone, as you can imagine, it's going to work completely different than oxytocin. So antidiuretic hormones effector cells are going to be in the kidneys. So antidiuretic hormone will get into the blood from the posterior pituitary, it will travel to the kidneys, and it's going to bind to those cells in the kidneys, and the kidneys are going to be instructed to reabsorb extra water from what would become the urine. So, uh, so what's going to happen here is that instead of water that obviously is in short supply here that would make it to the urine and we would excrete out of the body, what's going to happen instead is that water, which is precious to us right now, is going to be reabsorbed back into the blood so that we can keep that dehydration issue from getting worse than it already is. Now, we're gonna, make, we're gonna make sure that problem doesn't get worse than it already is, but that's not going to rehydrate us, which is why a parallel pathway happens so that you get the sensation of being thirsty so that you can drink some water and replenish that water that got lost from the blood. So overall, the effect of antidiuretic hormone is that urine volume will decrease in an effort to conserve water, and like I said, a separate pathway will cause the sensation of thirst. That's going to be what really fixes the problem. But as long as you are dehydrated and you're not able to drink water, the antidiuretic hormone's effects on the kidney does the job for us. Now, in contrast, the anterior pituitary absolutely is a bona fide endocrine gland. So you'll remember from that chart, there are six different hormones that are secreted by the anterior pituitary. But here's the deal. The anterior pituitary is not going to secrete any of these six hormones unless it gets the say-so from the hypothalamus. So to that end, the hypothalamus has its own hormones that it uses to communicate with the anterior pituitary. These hormones are called releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. As the name suggests, a releasing hormone will stimulate the release of a particular hormone from the anterior pituitary, and an inhibiting hormone will prevent the release of a hormone from the anterior pituitary. So another way of saying this is that some anterior pituitary hormones will not be secreted until a releasing hormone is, re a releasing hormone is received from the hypothalamus, and some anterior pituitary hormones will always be released unless they get that inhibiting signal from the hypothalamus as well. So we've already said that, okay, the hypothalamus makes these releasing and inhibiting hormones, and those hormones get to the cells of the anterior pituitary through that portal system of blood vessels that we talked about before. So that is actually called the hypophyseal portal system. It is a network of capillaries that directly connects the cells of the hypothalamus to the cells of the anterior pituitary. So this is a good thing for us because it ensures that that signal coming from the hypothalamus, that signal which is intended for the anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary alone, it ensures that that message gets straight to where it's supposed to go. So the hypothalamus doesn't have to make a whole bunch of hormone if the hormone was going to get into the general systemic circulation because if that were the case, the hormone would get all over the place and we'd have to secrete it in higher amounts to make sure that the anterior pituitary eventually gets it, right?
So the various cells of the anterior pituitary will have the correct receptors for these hormones, which allows them to either respond or not respond with a hormone of their own. So do not forget that the only way a hormone will do its job is if it's able to bind to a receptor. So if we go back to the hypothalamus for just a minute, in addition to actually making oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, now those two are secreted by the posterior pituitary, but don't forget the hypothalamus actually made them, the hypothalamus also will make six other hormones as well, four releasing hormones and two inhibiting hormones. So you can see in this chart, this is not a great chart. This chart actually came from a different textbook that I used to teach out of. So the chart from your textbook is a little bit better and we will look at that a little bit later. But here in the middle and on the right side of this table, you can see the different releasing and inhibiting hormones. And what these are matched up with is on the leftmost column, all the different anterior pituitary hormones. So what that essentially means is that if you see something under the releasing hormone category, just move over to the left and you will see the appropriate anterior pituitary hormone that that releasing hormone will stimulate. So for example, oxytocin will stimulate the production of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. So we're not really going to talk a whole lot about prolactin. So the idea here is that, say, after a mother gives birth, uh, a lot of milk production from the mammary glands is stimulated by the cry of a child. So the cry of a child does a lot to stimulate oxytocin release from the posterior pituitary and that oxytocin will get to the cells of the anterior pituitary and stimulate prolactin, which is important in the process of milk production. And then an inhibiting hormone for prolactin production is dopamine. So oxytocin stimulates prolactin production, dopamine stops it. For thyroid stimulating hormone, which is again one of the anterior pituitary hormones, the hypothalamus has to secrete this one first. So thyrotropin releasing hormone is necessary to be sent to the anterior pituitary so that it can produce TSH. CRH produced by the hypothalamus will stimulate ACTH from the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone releasing hormone will stimulate growth hormone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus will stimulate your gonadotropins, meaning follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So these are the releasing and inhibiting hormones that will go to the anterior pituitary and help the anterior pituitary to decide which hormones to secrete and which ones not to secrete. So it seems probably a little bit overwhelming that we've got all these hormones with all these strange sounding names, but focus on those names for just a second there because the thing I always tell my students is that if you focus on the name of one of these hormones, it should pretty much tip you off as to what it's intended to do. So for the most part, if say you look at growth hormone releasing hormone, well that one's pretty obvious. That's a hormone that is going to stimulate the release of growth hormone, right? So each one of these hormones, except for the case of oxytocin and dopamine and somatostatin, they pretty much are telling you exactly what they are going to do. So if you can kind of focus on that, that aspect, you should have a little bit of a better time. So now that we have an idea of which hormones need to be secreted by the hypothalamus in order to get the anterior pituitary to secrete its hormones, we can talk a little bit more about these anterior pituitary hormones. So let's start with growth hormone. So growth hormone, as we saw on the previous slide, it will be stimulated by growth hormone releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus and inhibited by somatostatin, which is also sometimes called growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So growth hormone is one of these rare hormones that really has receptors all over the place. So I said for most hormones, a very small percentage of cells have receptors. Growth hormone is an exception to that. Almost every cell in your body is going to have growth hormone receptors because what growth hormone does is it stimulates cell growth, cell development, protein synthesis, and promotes anabolic protein, nucleic acid, carbohydrate building processes that help us to construct new cells and to grow and recover.
So what growth hormone will do is it will cause some cells to switch over from using glucose as their primary energy source for cellular respiration to using lipids. So lipids like fatty acids and the like actually contain a lot more energy than carbohydrates. So this allows us to be a lot more energy efficient. However, growth hormone will also stimulate a process called glycogenolysis in the liver. So the liver, we'll talk about this more later, but the liver stores up glucose as a polymer called glycogen. So growth hormone will stimulate this process which breaks down glycogen and will raise blood glucose liver uh, levels by breaking down that stored glycogen. So an interesting thing is what happens when the anterior pituitary produces excess growth hormone. So this is going to produce two similar but separate conditions called acromegaly and gigantism. One of the most famous examples of this is the man on the far right here, Andre the Giant. So this is a picture taken from the set of the movie The Princess Bride, which is one of my all-time favorites. So uh, it's kind of hard to tell from this, but he's well over seven feet tall. So he's quite a large man, and he owed that in large part to excess production of growth hormone during his developing days. So he got very tall, uh, got very massive, and that's kind of what that was all about. So I always have to say this, but... Uh, the whole point of this in bringing up dwarfism, which is the result of inefficient or insufficient growth hormone production. Uh, so this has nothing to do with uh, the Princess Bride picture here. So uh, this is Wallace Shawn on the left here. I don't think that he actually had dwarfism. I just I just think Andre the Giant is that big. So I want to make sure that that's clear there. So this flowchart here just kind of summarizes what we said on the previous slide about the different effects of growth hormones. So I'm not going to feel compelled to say a whole lot more there, uh, but there it is in pictorial form if you really want to kind of focus on that. So let's move on to thyroid stimulating hormone. So TSH is secreted by the anterior pituitary, of course, but it's going to be stimulated by a different release hormone than growth hormone was. So this is the deal. Every hormone that the anterior pituitary makes, it has a particular hypothalamus hormone that is necessary to get it to be secreted. So in the case of thyroid stimulating hormone, which is secreted by the anterior pituitary, we first need the hypothalamus to make one of its hormones called thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH. So when TSH is secreted into the blood, TSH is going to bind to receptors on the cell of the thyroid. So that's exactly what it's telling you it's doing. Thyroid stimulating hormone, well, to me, that sounds an awful lot like a hormone that's going to stimulate the thyroid, right? So it makes sense. So the thyroid is going to respond by secreting two of its hormones, T3 and T4, two of its thyroid hormones that we briefly discussed before. So thyroid hormone production is going to be controlled via a very special negative feedback loop that is actually common to all hormones that are, that are controlled by anterior pituitary hormones. So TSH, ACTH, LH, and FSH. So this very special negative feedback loop is something that we will discuss soon. So it's not quite time for that yet though. So next, let's talk about the next anterior pituitary hormone called ACTH, or adrenocorticotropic hormone. So this is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol, as we mentioned before. So ACTH is actually not a hormone that is produced as it is in its final form. It's actually a part of a larger protein called proopiomelanocortin, or POMC. So the anterior pituitary makes this gigantic protein and then internal uh, enzymes will break down this very large protein by cleaving amino acids, cleaving those peptide bonds, and they basically chop that big protein up into little pieces. One of those little pieces is ACTH. Uh, other little pieces are other hormones such as melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is not a hormone that we're going to talk about, and then also opioid peptides called endorphins, which I'm sure you've heard of before. So the production of POMC and therefore ACTH is controlled by the hypothalamus hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH.
So next, let's talk about the two gonadotropins, which are called luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. So this is kind of a rare exception. So these both hormones are controlled by the same hypothalamus hormone, which is called GNRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So these two hormones tend to be secreted together. So the targets for both of these hormones are going to be the gonads. In men, we're talking about the testes, and in women, we are talking about the ovaries. So it's going to be a lot more complex, and in chapter 27, we would talk about this in great, much greater detail. But the general idea here is that follicle-stimulating hormone is going to stimulate your gamete production. So if men, you're talking about sperms and spermatogenesis, and women, we're talking about the ova and oogenesis. Whereas luteinizing hormone is generally going to be about sex hormone production, testosterone for men, estradiol, and pro progesterone for women. And then finally, we've already said a little bit about prolactin. So prolactin is inhibited by dopamine, also called prolactin inhibiting hormone, and oxytocin is the stimulator in this case. So as I mentioned, a baby's cry will stimulate the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, and then sensory neurons at the nipple will trigger a feedback mechanism that releases prolactin. So the suckling at the breast will actually send a message to uh, the uh, hypothalamus, which will get a message to secrete prolactin from the anterior pituitary. So just to kind of sum up what we've talked about so far, here is the posterior pituitary, so it only secretes two hormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. And as we mentioned, the posterior pituitary does not make these hormones. The hypothalamus made these hormones. And then the anterior pituitary, so this is the chart that I said was a little bit better in this case, so you can kind of follow from left to right how these hormones tend to go. So... The hypothalamus has its releasing and inhibiting hormones that it uses to decide which pituitary hormones get secreted when and where. So we will have some more to say about some of these hormones later on as we start looking at some of these endocrine glands in isolation, like the thyroid, the gonads, and the adrenal glands. So to end off here on this very long video, unfortunately, let's talk about that special feedback loop that I mentioned. So you'll recall that we said that we want to keep hormones in balance, right? We don't want to make too much hormone and we don't want to make not enough. Well, this is especially complicated when you're talking about a feedback loop like this that involves three different glands and multiple hormones. So we've got releasing and inhibiting hormones coming from the hypothalamus. We've got what are called tropic hormones coming from the anterior pituitary. So those are TSH, ACTH, LH, FSH, and the like. And then whichever gland is going to be on the receiving end of that anterior pituitary hormone, so either the thyroid, the adrenal cortex, or the gonads, we've got three different hormones to be concerned with here. So the negative feedback is going to look quite a bit different. So this is going to be very important. So I definitely make sure I pay attention to this. So let's start at the beginning here. Let's say that without picking a particular pathway, let's just keep this nice and general for now. Let's say the hypothalamus releases one of its releasing hormones. So that releasing hormone is going to get into the hypophyseal portal system and bind to a receptor on the cells of the anterior pituitary. And depending on which releasing hormone that was, the anterior pituitary is going to respond with one of its tropic hormones, whether it's ACTH or TSH or whatever, it depends. It's going to depend on which one the hypothalamus secreted. So this tropic hormone will bind to a receptor on either the thyroid if it was TSH, the adrenal cortex if it was ACTH, or the gonads if it was, say, LH. So those glands will then respond with their hormones. So the thyroid would make thyroid hormone, the adrenal cortex would make cortisol, and the gonads would make testosterone or estrogen, for example. So these hormones are then going to bind to all different target tissues throughout the body. So you can appreciate, hopefully, how complex this is already, and we haven't really even talked about how the negative feedback works here. So the general idea of how the negative feedback is going to work here is that 
once you produce a sufficient amount of a particular hormone, that hormone is going to bind to the receptors on a previous gland and shut down the production of an earlier hormone in the chain. So for example, if we look at this terminal hormone here, whether it's thyroid hormone or cortisol or sex hormone, that hormone will bind to receptors on the anterior pituitary and shut down the production of that tropic hormone. Also, it will bind to receptors on the hypothalamus and shut down the production of the hypothalamus hormone. Similarly, the tropic hormone can bind to the hypothalamus and shut things down that way. So, by producing the latest hormones in the chain, once we make enough of those hormones, those hormones go back to prior glands in the chain and shut down the production of the earlier hormones. Otherwise, we keep the production of hormone on for way too long and we end up producing way, way, way too much hormone. All right, so finally, that is going to do it for this video. So join us next time, and we are going to finish off the chapter by talking about each of the major classical endocrine glands one by one. So we'll start with the thyroid. We'll get into the adrenals. We'll talk about the pancreas. We'll talk about the uh, gonads. And then we'll finish off by talking about endocrine pathologies. So I thank you for your attention in this very long video. See you next time. Bye-bye.